Welcome our panelists. Marjorie Yang, Chairman, Eskel Group. Neela Montgomery, CEO, Crate and Barrel. And our moderator, Linda Henry, Managing Director, The Boston Globe. Hello, hello. I'm so excited about this topic. And I first want to say thank you all for being here. And thank you to um, MIT Saul for finding so many extraordinary women leaders to highlight today. We're here with two great executives, um, the CEO of Crate and Barrel and the chairman of Escar Group to, uh, sorry, can you help me say it right? Escal. Escar <laughs> Group to, um, talk, who are not only driving incredible growth and um, and success in their companies, but who are also been incredibly committed to encouraging women leadership in their firms. And so today we get to talk about how they've been, able, been so successful in doing that. Neela, I'm gonna start with you. Um, you talked, uh, I got to see a video of you talking about a shift in corporate culture that you've observed in your career where before women had to sort of suit up and pretend that they weren't women in order to be successful. Can you talk about how you've seen that change? Sure. I mean, I remember when I first started working in um, Tesco, which was a fairly male-dominated retail environment, but a very large company, um, a lot of the women basically talked about, you know, put on your suit of armor, you have to be out alpha the men, um, never make it an issue that you have kids at home that might compromise your ability to do work. I remember even when I was first promoted to a director, I got a stylist. They sent me a stylist who would make me seem more like a director. <laughs> and, um, and I remember her advice was like, don't wear so much red. <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, it was very much the, uh, so, so we've moved on. Um, but it was very much this like, you know, we want you to be this corporate um, feminine view. And I think now the great thing is that things have really evolved with my generation of leaders in that, you know, we can talk about the challenges of having kids. We can wear red, we can wear sequins if we want. Um, we can bring our femininity to work and we don't Why? really... What, what, what has changed culturally that women are allowed to bring themselves? Is it, is it a tone set by leaders like you that allow women to do that? Yeah, I think that it has definitely helped. I think that a lot of the women who have progressed through now do have children and are talking about the more feminine model of leadership and living it. And I think obviously that's the best way, the role modeling. But I also think a lot of the male attitudes have changed too. I mean, uh, I, when I was in Germany, it was just as acceptable for a man to say, oh, I'm, I can't do that meeting because I've got to be at my kid's performance. Um, and, and obviously that will be, that will help too in terms of evolving corporate cultures to be less stereotypical, just full stop. So how do we continue opening up the, this conversation? So you've said that role modeling, men doing it as well. What else can we do to continue to make uh, workplaces a place where women can bring their whole selves? Yeah, I mean, I hope that especially the younger generation of women will really think about uh, choosing an employer that allows that authenticity because there's a lot of kind of corporate speak about we want you to bring your best self to work and but I think what's critical is that when women are making those career choices they really kind of investigate companies from a data perspective you know does the data match the the rhetoric are they really committed to letting me be my best self? And, and um, I think that will change a lot. There's such a war for talent. You have the power now to really drive cultures to change. So employees have the power now to also look for it, what, they're, what they need. Um, Marjorie, you began leading the Escal Business Group after, since 1995, you were chairman, right? Yes. Which is remarkable. And your sister, your daughter, and your niece all hold roles there. What, what about your family's upbringing encouraged such strong representation of women in business? Well, first of all, I'm really glad that you didn't ask me about the how to dress question because <laughs> I can tell you, well-endowed woman is never gonna make it as a good-looking man, <laughs> never gonna fit in. <laughs> so I'm glad you gave her that question. Okay, um, how do I, 
how do we accommodate so many women from well, the same family? Encourage, yeah. what, no, what, what in your family encourage women to really step forward um, and take these leadership roles? First, by having daughters, um, only daughters. <laughs> 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 My father is an extremely liberal, open-minded man because he has only two daughters. <laughs> and then I have a one daughter, only one daughter, and my sister had three kids, but two daughters and then finally a son. So the family culture is daughters are wonderful. And especially this one because I was born in the year of the dragon. That's, and of course, important. being a dragon is more important than being a man. <laughs> I guess that lays the foundation of why our, our company and our family is so receptive to um, strong women. You were telling me that you were 11 when your sister was born, and yes. you, you have a distinct memory of that. Oh, yes. So um, my sister is 11 years younger than me, and uh, I can remember hearing my aunt, who was in the hospital, calling my father and said, uh, of course, I didn't hear her on the other side, but... I'm so sorry, it's another girl. And at 11, you understand, and you say, there's something wrong with that statement. So, you know, being a child from a Chinese, a good tra traditional Chinese family, um, I felt maybe at 11 that I'm gonna show them. It's wonderful to have daughters. I'm, uh, we were talking backstage, I'm, I grew up in an immigrant family business um, here in the US and um, I was the youngest of four girls and my father wanted a son uh, very badly and after me he gave up and raised <laughs> us to, uh, to run the business. So I can, I, I can see how, how the having daughters strategy can be helpful. Um, uh, but you, in addition to having a daughter to begin with, how can we raise girls and young women to see their own leadership potential? Um, I think I was very fortunate. And by the way, I come from a different generation from these two <laughs> young ladies. So in my generation, there were very few, or rather fewer women role models. And I was very fortunate Apart from having a very liberal father, I also had quite a few very strong um, women uh, role models, I, including the headmistress of the primary school that I went to. Uh, she was very, very special. So as a young child, I was able to look up to um, all these women. And so it, it just almost became very casual to see women in leadership roles. So for you, role models was a really important thing, seeing women doing in leadership positions and, and being able to emulate women. Yes, you get used to it you. and you feel that just this is very natural. Um, Neela, you mentioned that you worked at Tesco. You were there for 12 years mm -hmm. and you did something really remarkable. You left a company you were successful in for 12 years for a new job in a new role in a new country. What role has risk taking played in your career? Yeah, I mean, that's interesting because I have always thought of myself as a risk taker and I never imagined I would stay with any company for 12 years. So that was probably more remarkable in itself. But I mean, I went to Germany to work for a family owned, all male, all German, uh, average age, 20 years older than me board and I joined that board and one thing that was incredibly helpful was kind of naivety. I didn't quite understand how remarkable that was because I didn't really quite know enough about German business culture and I do think there's something about risk taking which is if you examine every single option or outcome from every different perspective, you will eventually persuade yourself that you shouldn't do it because typically risks are, risks are like that. So, so there is something about the, like, the unexamined life as well as the examined life and thinking about, you know, do I really need to imagine every possibility and every angle or is there a just, a, just jump? kind of mentality and I just jumped 
And it could have been a horrible failure. And if, if so, I would have had to deal with it and I'd have recovered and you know, I'd still have the success that I'd had in my past. So I think what's very important, especially as you get more senior in your career, is recognizing that you have to keep jumping. Mm. That it isn't like you suddenly get here and it's all kind of rosy at the top. I mean, you know, there's, there's all kinds of other risks you have to keep continuing to take. And what you have to recognize is that, you know, failure is going to happen along the way, but it isn't going to kill you. And you'll, you'll pick yourself up and the people who love you will still love you. And um, you're still, you know, I'm still Neela, if I, even if I'm not the CEO of Crane and Barrow. The fact that you still know who you are, I think, is a really important message. But how do we encourage more women to take career risks? Yeah, I think about this a lot, and I talk, I talk, on, I speak on this subject a lot because I do feel that it's something it, that's taught at quite an early age. I think the school system, for example, is very important in that, in terms of encouraging women to fail earlier in life, I think would be very helpful because I think there is something about the school system that doesn't encourage it as much and I can't quite put my finger on why. But I do think as a parent as well, I mean, I speak to all of you who have daughters, I don't, um, really pushing your daughters not to think every possible outcome through and, and encouraging them to jump Mm. is something I think that all of us can do. I mean, from a corporate perspective, I certainly was pushed by mentors, by uh, sponsors, both male and female. And I think that can continue to happen. But a lot of this, I think, happens earlier. Mm. Um, Marjorie, you, you mentioned school. And you had a very good experience going to an all-girls school. Yes, at one stage, I started off in Hong Kong as a co-ed school. And then I came to the U.S. and I was in an um, all-girls school for about three years and before I came to MIT. And I thought that was a very unique opportunity. It uh, really allowed me to uh, feel uh, very, uh, feel my, developing my full potential. And I, I think that uh, it's a shame that we don't have more um, girls' schools as a, as a choice mm -hmm. uh, because that really allowed me to see a side of myself uh, which I didn't have that opportunity when I was at a co-ed school. Mm -hmm. I, I want to talk about, stay on you for one more minute because you have had incredible board experience and you've had some board experience as well, but you, you have gotten in the habit of saying yes to being on boards. And I want to talk about um, why and what you learned and, and why that matters so much? <laughs> oh, what I was trying to explain to, it was that I very, now I, even though if I don't know, well, I'll give you the ex exact example so that you don't think that I'm crazy. I was asked <laughs> to join the um, advisory of the Seoul Mayor's International Advisory by a friend and I said, I don't really know very much about so and Korea. He said, but you will be the first woman. I said, okay, I'm on. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, and I, because I have a daughter, and as I got, get older, I feel the need to take on all opportunities to prove that women can be uh, value adding at a board, uh, Okay, I was 45 when I joined the Gillette board. And, um, and that was here in Boston. So and it was here in Boston. And it was Warren Buffett who was very kind to me. He took me to the first uh, shareholders meeting, etc. And I sat next to him one day and I said, you know, I really don't know how I can add value to the board, but today I think I have an opportunity. I want to share with the board that it, most Asian women don't shave their legs. And therefore, the numbers projected for the Asian market could be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was adding, that was the yes, first time I was adding value. Adding value. Pretty important. <laughs> Pretty important, right? Um, so 
I, I grasp at these opportunities to be the first woman, and then I try very hard to find a way to show that we can add value because we see things differently. Um, and being different is value add uh, rather than you're defective. <laughs> Neela, I love that uh, under your leadership at Crate and Barrel, you've really owned your numbers. So you've been really public about how 70% of your customer base is female, around 70% of your store associates are female, and 68% of your leadership team is female, which is remarkable. And I love that you're owning it and pushing that forward. How, how does this diversity drive the business outcomes for Crate and Barrel? Well, it's funny. It very much um, builds on what Marjorie just said. I mean companies these days are obsessed with customer focus, customer centricity, customer focus. And it's so much easier to be customer focused when your leadership team reflects and your associate base reflects your customers. So our customer base is 70% female and that exactly is mirrored in our, in our leadership and our associate profile. And it's a massive advantage because, you know, when you're talking about the customer, it's not some distant research concept. Or if I have to hear another man talk about how his wife shops, I mean, that's just, you know, it's like, um, and, and that happens a lot on boards, by the way, uh, still today. Uh, we just don't have those kind of, we just don't have that distance from the customer. And that helps enormously just in our discussions and our decision making. But I think also what's very, I mean, we rarely talk about diversity, if I'm honest, other than, you know, racial or economic uh, sometimes. Um, it almost becomes, because it is the norm and we do reflect um, our customer base, we end up, I end up talking about it more externally than I do internally, which is interesting. Um, and I, I hope that's where many corporations will be over time. And so there's a contrast, for example, between um, a leadership team that's 70% female talking about you know, meeting their customers' needs, what you're talking is, is what you're saying, is that you have a, a closer understanding. And there's a contrast, for example, to uh, Victoria's Secret, which is run by um, a male executive talking about redriving to focus on their customers. That's um, right. And that's an interesting example where that was very much driven by a male's view of what sexy was, but it's the women who need to buy the underwear as well or the lingerie. So, I mean, I think that's a danger you can fall into if, you, if you're not close enough to your customer. And especially given the disruption of tech these days, you just can't afford that distance from your customer anymore. So how can other organizations or sectors adopt this model? You don't have to go to that exact mirroring no. of your customers as, as you've done so effectively, but what, what, can, what can we learn from Crate well, and Barrel? And I do think that, I mean, Marjorie's example is a good one, which is, so for example, if you're trying to approach the Asian market and you don't have people around the table at a board level, at a team level, at an advisory level who understand that consumer or that market, that's a mistake, and I would hope that most companies are trying to do that. I find it interesting with smaller companies and startups especially, it's hard to achieve that because you haven't yet got the scale. So what I would really advise is find a broad um, spectrum of, of advisors who can help you on that journey um, and really figure out kind of what is gonna challenge my own assumptions here and bring me closer to either the customer or how I'm building this business. Um, Marjorie, you've been doing, not only have you been tackling this in corporate boards and, and various boards around the world, but within your own company, you've been working to really tackle gender inequality and, and other forms. Can you tell some of what you've been doing at your own company? Well, our industry, I'm in a textile and apparel industry, and uh, historically, there have been many women leaders in that industry, uh, particularly in Hong Kong. So that's an advantage to start off with. But then as we become a more international, um, we go to different parts of the world where it is not that obvious to have allowed for women leadership. This is why I think that a company like ours, particularly being a, um, uh, at one stage, our company 
were so dominated by women leaders, I was afraid that we were going to have a case where some men is going to go to Equal Opportunity Commission <laughs> mm, and too. complain about us. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, what I've found is that uh, with that, because we have a very um, predominantly uh, a lot of strong women, if you can imagine, uh, to create an environment where the younger women are getting more and more into details and then um, looking at how to drive gender equality in countries that are not used to having the same kind of uh, opportunity for women. Uh, sorry for... Well, your daughter actually did a study as well. Yes. Uh, I didn't expect it, but because she's not in HR, she runs a division that um, have our own brands. She looked at the numbers on pay of manufacturing, uh, the factory workers in the different countries. And she noticed that in Mauritius, there is a, uh, the women are making less. But then she didn't jump to conclusion. She then said, I am going to go and look at the numbers further to see why. Because and that, to me, that's very encouraging, because rather than just jumping into conclusion, if, or if I was doing it at my level, I'd probably say, management of Mauritius, you have a gender bias. Here is a young woman who then will take the time to look at the numbers in more detail and not accuse the management, uh, and in this case, they are men, to accuse them of having gender bias. And I think that's very important, to be um, not scare men so that they then artificially do something to raise the income of women. And so what did your daughter find? Well, the reason? she's suspecting, and this is much very difficult to um, determine, that it is sometimes by choice. So there are certain lifestyle decisions that women would make differently. Mm -hmm. And they may not put, um, because they may choose to work less mm. uh, and have a, um, maybe they have family obligations. Uh, but it's uncertain exactly what is. But the good news is the fact that she has an interest yep. and there are a group of young women in the company who takes this kind of interest and who will look in depth to make sure that something is being done but not rush into just accusing men or women in leadership positions of having gender bias. Um, I think that what this study indicates in your sort of approach to it of being thoughtful and not just going at the numbers and looking at the culture um, because you have such a, a global company. Um, but that comes with a luxury of being both private companies. You both work for privately held companies. Um, Neela, what are your thoughts on, on what that difference is? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think very carefully as an executive, and I would in any further move I made in my career about what is the ownership structure, who are my investors and what are their expectations? Are they short term or long term? Are they genuinely committed to diversity? And I think it's, it's interesting. I don't know that I spent enough time learning about that early in my career. Because earlier in my career, I was like, I'm just going to learn to be a good leader and a good functional person and, you know, climb the ladder and eventually someone will recognize me and that'll work. And um, what I probably didn't understand is that it doesn't, the ladder doesn't end, right? At the top, there is always somebody out investing in you and believing in you. And having, um, understanding how power works in your industry, understanding how money flows, understanding the values of those that are investing in you is, I think, now uh, critical. And if I could talk to my younger self, it's something I would definitely say to myself, like, don't be so naive, go and learn about that, because it really matters. What's interesting about that is that you would almost think it would be the opposite, that the big public companies have the, you know, the requirements of a certain number of women on their boards or whatnot. But, you know, what you're, what you're talking about as well is that it's, it's not that the requirements, it's an ethos. I, I think you... This is a very good point, and I think it's a very important point. Because there are more women now in positions of um, power, should we say, that we have to be very careful and uh, not just use these 
uh, statistics, you have to have 30% yep. representation on a public company board. Uh, all that, I think we should leave, we should move on. And for us who, we are very um, fortunate to have the opportunity to lead companies to then um, go into more detail and not just um, very take the easy way out and just look at statistics to promote women or gender equality. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's up to us to now work uh, harder, but there's a lot more work to be done. It's just that we've gone over the first hurdle of just having some st meeting some statistics. And that's what public companies tend to do. But private companies, we have an opportunity to go a lot deeper. Great. Um, I think that there's so much that we can learn from both of you. Thank you so much for your, for your expertise and, and your leadership and your trailblazing. Both of you are doing an incredible amount. And I want to thank all of you here for, for stepping up. What MIT is doing here today is really special and it's really unique. I'm involved in a lot of events, but to really say that we are going to put our minds together and tackle some of these really big issues together is remarkable. So thank you all for your time and thank you both for your leadership. Thank you.